for my response, I'd like to do three things. I want to first try to draw out this theme of uh, what DH means for the classics profession from the presentations we've heard, um, add one point to that myself, and then ask one or two questions to of the panelists to uh, then lead into the um, general discussion. So um, I think we could, one way of grouping the, the papers or the presentation we've heard is to say that they address sort of um, what the profession of classics is now with DH included um, as it is, uh, what it can be, and then finally how you might succeed in it. Uh, so I want to just hit those three uh, or talk about those three themes with respect to some of these papers. So um, with respect to uh, what the profession is now, what one of the things that interested me about Chris Johansson's um, presentation to start with him was that you know, he, he seems to have the built into their MA curriculum, their MADH curriculum, is the, uh, or I should say, he has the, um, uh, that is sort of PhD minor, I guess it is, um, or graduate student minor uh, in DH, that there's this implicit notion that that, that at least for classics, makes uh, DH kind of an add-on ancillary um, um, skill along with your primary classics training. So um, one of the questions I want to raise when we get to the end here is, is that what we imagine and, and is that the way things are going to go in the future? Is it possible to be, you know, that, that's kind of implicit in the way that he is, has structured the curriculum. Is that what it should be or, or what it will be in the future? Uh, the second point then is um, what can DH look like within the field of classics or what does the field of classics look like with DH Incorporated? Um, I think Chris Blackwell's presentation gives us a an idea of what that is and can be um, in the sense that um, he, it, I mean, many of the speakers, we, we sp speakers we've heard from today um, highly privileged the involvement of undergraduates in their uh, research uh, and the undergraduate component of pedagogy and students involved in research seems to be very important. Uh, so if, we're talk if, if we take for a moment these presenters and what they're doing, let's f say for a moment that's going to be a model of what happens in the future. Uh, with people using DH in the profession, and if that expands, then we're talking about a, a, an increasingly uh, heavy involvement of undergraduates um, in research work that's DH inflected. Uh, so that's one sort of vision both of where we are now and where the profession might, um, might go. Uh, another thing that's Im potentially implicit in the work Chris is doing uh, is this question of, um, you know, is there a new sort of renaissance of textual criticism in the, with, with digital methods? Uh, and I think that the work that's been displayed here, uh, you know, Christian Hans is not here to defend uh, his non-textual work, but uh, um, uh, shows that that is, seems to be the case, right? I mean, one can only imagine if, if we proceed along these lines that, um, you know, we're experiencing or, or are in the middle of a kind of new golden age of, of philology um, that involves uh, text and involves undergraduates and so on. So that, you know, if, if these models are sustainable and expandable in the way that, that, uh, that, that maybe Greg has foreseen, then that may be where we're heading. Uh, and I think that takes me to Greg's presentation, um, which looks even more towards the future. Um, and I might try to sum up some of what he said, which was uh, by saying that he se seems to envision a kind of classics playing field that's both uh, flattened and expanded, right, where everybody has uh, access and opportunity through the tools that are provided um, to do classics work from an undergraduate up to a uh, professional level and potentially including the public at large. And the expansion of the field is to uh, incorporate all of historical languages or at least have some interoperability with them and maybe other fields as well. So if we ask what is the profession, how, the pro how is the profession going to be changed uh, on I think on Greg's vision, that's, that's one of the ways. We're going to sort of level the playing field and expand it and, and develop uh, strength by, um, by collaborating with, with uh, colleagues and students in other disciplines, right, um, in, in realizing that we're doing some of the same or maybe a lot of the same things and that we can um, learn from one another both about our own native disciplines and across disciplines. So that seems to be, um, that was my second point. So he's, what, is, what does the field look like now with DH in it? Uh, what is it going to look like with DH in it? And then finally the question was, uh, the, the third point was, um, you know, how are people succeeding in it? Um, and um, I think Marie Claire gives us an example of a, 
uh, a junior faculty member, as she says, probably the person most recently uh, tenured who has a, a heavy, heavy, at least a heavy digital component to her profile. I don't want to, she can define her profile for herself. Uh, but um, their part of the recipe seemed to be to obviously integrate, uh, I think, and I hope I want to ask you about this, uh, her research with her um, uh, digital undergraduate efforts. So the research, pedagogy, it all hangs together to some degree. Um, then, um, of course, Bruce just now has given us another uh, example of how we succeed, uh, one succeeds in the profession um, doing a digital humanities work, and, and I won't recapitulate all the great advice that he just gave us, but uh, of course one of those uh, key points was um, to inv avoid the pitfall of re reinventing the wheel, uh, work with established projects, and collaborate with established projects, um, and I think implicit in a larger sense is you have to kind of change your mindset a little bit, or maybe you said that explicitly, about what it is that you're going to be um, doing and how you see yourself in the profession um, as, a, as a collaborator, uh, as often as a leader, perha perhaps. Um, so uh, those are the ways that I would try to sum up you know, what the vision that we've gotten here uh, pulled all together about how the profession has changed with the um, advent of robust uh, digital humanities and how it might be changing uh, as we go forward. Um, one of the points that I wanted to um, raise, and then maybe just uh, I'll, I'll turn some more of these questions to our panel, um, is what seems like maybe an abstract or, or um, minor one, uh, well, maybe it depends on your situation, which is, uh, and has been touched on, I think, by Marie Claire and by Chris, and I asked a question of Chris, you know, what does this, you know, what do the standards of our uh, institutions say about digital work, and what does that mean for um, who gets hired, uh, who gets uh, tenured, and who gets promoted. Um, a, a simple mechanical way of looking at the situation would be to say that if you, know, if you don't have some assurance to um, people who are coming into those positions that uh, digital work will be valued on par with um, non-digital work, traditional work, then y you simply won't get people applying for these jobs and you won't get people training for them either. Right. I mean, I don't think it's the case, I hope it's not the case that every job seeker is going out and scrutinizing the uh, tenure standards of all the institutions that um, he or she is applying to jobs for. Maybe they do. Uh, but, uh, but even if that's not the case, uh, I think it has to be true that eventually those standards that are set up there are going to flow all the way back to what were people doing in graduate school and even as an undergraduate. So um, one of the points that I want to, to point out to everyone is uh, I asked Chris, you know, what were the standards at UCLA for uh, his, for digital work, and he, um, he was also promoted on the strength of his uh, digital work, I think exclusively, uh, not to publications and, and the actual digital content. Um, and he re referred to the MLA standards uh, that support uh, the, um, the valuing of digital work in personnel processes. He also referred to the analogs of the School of Architecture at UCLA. Um, it's worth noting for this audience that uh, the SES does have a statement on its website for what it's worth that does endorse this kind of work, and this was reformulated about three years ago. Uh, and it reads in part, uh, faculty members who develop or disseminate uh, digital pedagogical materials, research tools, or scholarly products should receive due, ne due recognition. Um, and uh, in, with the express purpose of fostering more creative activity and combining these digital and traditional skills, the society urges that departments and institutions give due recognition in the tenure and promotion process to contributions to the classics that make a significant use of electronic t technologies. So um, just, y you might know if this is a concern to you that that, that statement's there and can be appealed to. Uh, it, it also might be useful for those, anybody who's actually involved in standard setting at their institutions if you believe that this is valuable work to um, you know, raise your voice at the appropriate time to ensure that it's um, um, duly recognized in these standards, because I think that'll be an important uh, issue going forward. So um, with that one point I raised, I'd like to then um, turn back to the panel and ask uh, some questions here just to get the comment, then we'll open it up the floor up for general discussion. Um, maybe I could start by asking on my last point, what, no, oh, I gotta be quiet myself. I, I, just right. Um, what, what can you all say about standards at your institutions, this point that I just raised, and what they are, what they should be, maybe what they could be for the, for the profession in terms of um, 
personnel, uh, DTH work with res respect to personnel actions. And maybe, I, Greg, you want to start? In, in yeah, because I want to, I want to frame some of the things that happen here. And I just say that when I first heard about the Homer Multitext project, or that Greg, was, my Greg Naj, my advisor, was working on digitizing a manuscript, my thought was, what? Uh, we don't do manuscripts anymore. We do like the body or whatever. It's, it, it wasn't cool, I thought. Uh, and then when I saw for the first time the students working at, in Holy Cross, you know, reading a text they didn't think they would care about, and reading like Greek they shouldn't be able to understand in incomprehensible abbreviations, and doing it for free, and doing it because they loved it because it was a contribution to knowledge, it totally, I was had been completely wrong, and it transformed how I thought. That in part led, in, led to the job description that, that <laughs> Professor Beaulieu described. And I can tell you that that was 2009, to put that out, that was the bottom of the job market, right after it collapsed. There were no jobs, and we had a tenure track job at Boston. We saw the field. No, but hardly anybody even acknowledged that statement about undergraduates and MA level people uh, you know, being able to contribute. Professor Bola, Dr. Bola, uh, was like stood out because she understood that. We would ask people, we asked every single person we interviewed, what would you do about that? Most of them acted like they were asking about their intimate lives uh, and, and shuffled in their seats, had no idea. Uh, and Professor Bolio showed up, she had no XML or anything, she, was, she just got the principal. In your first semester, you saw your first year, you saw medieval Latin, uh, and worked with someone in the library. They put up an HTML site translating this, because of course nobody had translated this medieval Latin. It was useful. And all of a sudden, people said, holy cow. They took a class, and it was actually something that was like, it contributed something useful. The dean said to me, I think I told you this, if you get more people, get more like Harvard. Uh, <laughs> and now you're, you, you, know, you spend all your time in front of the trustees. Uh, showing that classics actually is really cool. So I think this engaging our students as contributors and rethinking what we do uh, such that it empowers, it gives a voice to others, it's not just about us being smart, is a fundamental shift. And it really, uh, it, I think, is a healthier, happier, I'm not, it, insofar as I can think like that or work with people like that, you know, it's not just getting your growth a job, it's just it's a nicer space. That's great. Uh, and then, Larry Craig, do you want to comment as the person again who was recently tenured on like what your standard work your institute has done and what, you know, what that looks like to you? Yeah. Maybe all the way from, from, from getting a job or before you get the job all the way up to tenure? Sure. So, uh, well, I described the process of getting the job and I felt that that was a, that was a good process. Um, but I think, uh, you know, what was interesting is that in the process of getting the job, actually my, my job talk was described to me by Greg as, you've got to teach a class that's scholarly. So show us what that might look like. And that's, I believe, what I did. Um, but the point is that throughout the process, this, uh, this question of undergraduates performing at a very high professional level uh, was emphasized, and that's what that's what this job track has been about the whole time. Um, and I've been very happy doing that. It's very motivating um, because I think I have a constant challenge of finding new ways to implement that. And, uh, and your students come to you with projects. So now we have students designing their own projects and so forth, right? So uh, it's, been, um, it's been great on that front. As far as the tenure uh, process went, uh, it, it's been all about explaining uh, how this work is scholarly. And I think that there are many ways of doing that. I've shown a few here and, and explaining how we're contributing to the field and how uh, this mingles in my own research. And I'm sort of hitting your other question here. Um, it doesn't contribute directly in the sense that it's not putting uh, it's not putting data into my own research that I put under my own name. It's putting, um, it's putting ideas in my mind mostly, which, uh, which I'm very um, and the idea being that um, it's contributing to our general principles uh, under which we operate, and it's contributing also to the study of epigraphy, which is one of my research areas, and also to the study of ancient religion, which is my other area. So 
Uh, I've also published a book, so I'm on a more traditional track there. Uh, but it's a, about explaining how do these two mesh together, right? Because they're not separate. It's, it's how the digital work feeds the rest or whatever. Uh, but there is a, a general narrative there. Um, and so explaining that to the committee, I think, has been the, uh, the substance of the tenure process. I think, I think a potential graduate student can now, now can look at you and say, well, that's great that she <laughs> can do an amazing amount of work and has done sort of double or triple duty, but that looks hard, uh, you know? Um, is that, I mean, it sounds like you're energized by the, by the work you're doing as well, obviously, so maybe that's, that's the conversation, but I think there's, there it seems to be that we've had a discussion for a while at the PCA meeting in 2013 about, you know, are there, is there peer review for digital projects, and if there is, then, you know, could you, you know, say, ten years or something, project, and you know, I don't think we've gotten that far exactly, although there's some initiatives, um, you know, but, 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 but by barring that, one might say, well, great, you're doing everything you had to do for tenure anywhere else, and then a lot more, right, <laughs> or, or something. <laughs> is, that, is that how you feel, or? You know, I, I think that's an important question, and it's probably something that's of interest to, to many uh, members of the audience here. Do you have to, you know, do the safe thing and then do the rest and hide it if you can or something like that? Um, so my answer is no, and I think um, I think a big part of that is showing that the work we're doing in the classroom is research, right? And that um, that how you're going to teach, being deliberate about that, how are we going to mentor these students to design their own project and go further and all of that? That is research, and that is the activity of a scholar and and no, no one else could do that, you see what I'm saying, right? So that it has been part of the, uh, of the argument there. Um, and I don't disown my book, uh, that's another, <laughs> you know, that was a fun undertaking. I looked up a whole bunch of dolphins and it was great. Um, <laughs> so that's fine. Um, I am energized by what I do and I think that, um, yeah, I think that this work is not, is not categorized properly. That is the issue, right? So tenure committees will go, what's your service? What's your research? What's your teaching? And the three are completely intermingled. And with the service now, we're putting this new program together. Well, that's all research, too, is if you ask me, right? Being deliberate about how do we do this, that's research. You've got to look up the scholarship on these questions. You've got to look up what's going on elsewhere, et cetera. So that would be my answer. I'd say that even with all these standards, it's extremely mobile. I mean, it, it, it is a slippery thing, and people can at times sort of say, oh yeah, I get it now, this is, and then at other times, with the same project say, that's just a website. I mean, I, you know, you could just throw that on the web, and anybody can do that, and you know, big deal. Uh, I noticed this uh, observing the grant adjudication project uh, process for SHRC, the Canadian uh, Federal um, Granting Agency in the Humanities and Social Sciences, I observed, for a whole week, without saying anything, um, the partnership development grant, so big money. And it seemed, it, I could not perceive how people were assessing digital things. I was very attuned to this, because it mattered to me, and it just felt like the criteria were somewhere under the table, still. Um, are there any solution on the horizon, as far as you see, or? I think as a, as a community, we'll sort of, uh, you know, um, build this together in a way, and have, have a sense, but I still think there's, the possibility of, of just sort of saying that's a website and I did that in junior high school, so big deal. Um, yeah. But if there were some sort of, if it ever happened, peer review, well, yeah. that would solve problems, we don't have that entirely. The SES is not publishing reviews of digital projects. Sorry. <laughs> please <laughs> sign up, please volunteer your project to be volunteer, uh, to be reviewed, or for yourself to review a project, not your own. Uh, <laughs> you can look at the SES. <laughs> Webpage, you can see how to do that. Thank you very much. Um, animals, or? Oh. I think we've probably covered a lot of things Bruce said. You know, my institution's small, we're also a three person department. So decisions you know, um, involve at most two members of, a de of the department. Um, and that makes things very different. And so the promotion and tenure goes before a committee, and as a Mount Allison, it consists of people from across the curriculum. You know, a bunch of chemists and 
you know, health science people are not going to care whether AJP is slightly more or less prestigious than, you know, some other journal, right? Um, which is harder and easier. I mean, if you have a lot of traditional publication, then that um, at a small place, you might be obliged to do what you would not be obliged to do at the University of Michigan, which is say, so what? Right? It's like, oh, I've you know, written these articles in these journals, and, and you know, chemists don't care. Like, what? And first of all, the chemists don't care because they, you know, you've only written three articles. <laughs> and, you know, they're in a situation where like every week, everybody in the building is authored like 50 different articles. Right? So, um, and so I, I think it can be more flexible. I think it does make you know, experience the burden on the narrative. You have to be able to answer the so what question. And if you and if you can do that well, then in, in our experience, you will. It, it also helps at, at, at Furman that. In you know after separating from the from the Southern Baptist Convention in the 80s, from it cast about for an identity that was like more compelling than easier to get into than Duke <laughs> as a slogan. <laughs> um, but uh, and they came up with this idea of engaged learning was going to be the kind of central thing. And it's not just um, marketing language; they really tried to mean it. So that for our stuff, like that made it a lot easier, like to to cast that narrative. Why what you know, this kind of work is important is because it directly you know, meets the definitive value of the institution. Chris, how many Fulbrights have you produced? Um, we we had a at Furman we had two two last year. Two. Research how big trials. is your how big is your department? Three faculty. How about Holy Cross? How many? They, two to three. Yeah, they they, they have one a year, don't they? Yeah, they do every year. Yeah. They, was a long way with their dean and with their parents. Well, in this, yeah, in a small <laughs> place, you're also answerable more to deans and trustees, who in some ways are much easier to impress than, you know, our, like, flinty-eyed, cynical colleagues. <laughs> you know, deans and presidents and trustees want to be famous. And the digital stuff is easier, it's more out there, and it can be very photogenic. I mean, this is all kind of a cynical way to put it, but these are real aesthetic values. And having you know lovely young people doing cool looking stuff to get the parents of other lovely young people to send their kids there that's that's an easy sell. Your st one of your students is with us in Leipzig working with Monica Berti on uh, is it the digital Athenaeus or is she working on laws? Um, she's working. They produced the first really modern edition of fragmentary text, and this is the hardest problem of editing because it's a meta text. Monica has produced uh, first three volumes of Euler, uh, older material, but open CC license, uh, and a foundation upon which you can build without being sued, uh, which is a good way of working. And it's driven by you know, collaboration with many people, including Sammy, uh, who came over as an undergraduate. Yeah. And Alex, and Niels, the Holy Cross student, Niels student, I, I have to say, Alex Simrel, is it with our friend Nevin Yovanovitch in Zagreb, and reportedly he taught a class in, in Croatian uh, last week. His Croatian is good enough, he filled in for Nevin. So talk about that. Uh, our undergraduate kind of just being pretty quick. <laughs> I'm gonna ask my last question of the panel. Oh, oh sorry, Matt, you go ahead. I, I don't mean to interrupt your, if you're if you're still in your, your I might be. role, you should, I'll come right back to you, okay? Okay. And my last question is, if you have one piece of advice for a graduate student contemplating getting involved in digital brain, you've already given plenty of it, but let's get down to one. Uh, you know, what is that? Let's go down to one here. Well, the, the, the cynical thing is that, um, uh, you know, you are, you are there, the, the person who's going to keep the, the hiring committee and their department functioning. Uh, if you make the case that there's going to be a department of classics or people who take Greek and Latin in 20 or 30 years, or at least until the 40-year-old person retires uh, who, who is, leads the committee, uh, you know, then if you're going to be you know, uh, uh, cynical about it, the best way to do it is to think about the kinds of things that you've seen here and, and really 
it's not about making yourself smart. It's about engaging other people and, and really giving people a voice, uh, a scholarly voice, a voice of some kind, responsibility, citizenship. Uh, there's an immense amount of work to be done. And when I started out, I thought of it, oh my god, there's like this little, you look at the little library, that's all there is. How am I, you know, I, I, you know, how am I ever going to say anything new and you're just going to fight your way through? Now I look at it, we have nothing. We have no editions, we have no translations, we have no dictionaries, we have no commentaries, we have a bunch of, of legacy materials. The whole field has to be rebuilt. And you see a little of it here. You know, that, those tree banks, that's how you build a dictionary. They come from corpus linguistics. Uh, it's going to replace that replaces the LSJ uh, with really far more, far better data. We cited uh, so there's, there's immense amounts to be done right now. It is a new field, and classics is the biggest. And in some ways, we have all sorts of advantages you can talk about, uh, and you should exploit them all. I would say uh, I would say do something meaningful for you, Greg. Uh, there's immense amounts of things to be done. I agree with Greg. Um, I would say pick something that excites you personally and that you find meaningful. Uh, first of all, because then you can explain why it is that it matters, uh, which you're going to have to do many, many, many times. But also because that that's your opportunity to shape your own career, and that I think is one of the greatest perks that we have in academia. Is that we can have our career in our own hands. Uh, that's a luxury very few people have in this world, um, and I feel that that's a great opportunity to, to take that into your own hands. Learn to program with Python. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's, it, I did this with my uh, third year history students using the Natural Language Toolkit and a, and a corpus that you can get anywhere, and Jython notebooks, it's easy to get your feet wet and the knowledge is power. You, you, you can't do classics without Greek and Latin and there's an analogy there to traditional We used to Yeah, I like used to have a case of Barry and Neil say stuff, but you private and then I get to say it in public. <laughs> <laughs> in person, but, um, I, I guess I'll come back to this idea of, of, of working on the, the so what narrative um, for people who are going to, to whom you will describe your research or your dissertation. Um, classics no longer s speaks for itself and it no longer goes without saying. And I think that works at every level of granularity. And so for the people who will eventually be interviewing you, you know, to talk about the awesome thing that you're passionate about that you're doing your dissertation about and explain how it would be awesome when you bring it into the classroom at their institution, and we'll get the students excited and keep coming back so nobody gets fired. Um, and how you are going to present your also work to the deans and stuff and make the department that's gonna hire you, um, you know, in good odor with the administration and um, the recipient of gifts and favors. And to the students, um, come up with different ways, like work on the narratives of why it, why it matters. Um, and if you can, if you can come up with kind of non-classicy ways to describe classic stuff that we always do, that's that's helpful. So, you know, when, when I have computer science kind of students um, in my classes, I describe the Homer multiplex as a cyber physical system, and the NSF as a <coughs> category um, of research um, funding for cyber physical systems, and that's it's generically just like a power station or anything else, um, if you look at it right. And so this is a narrative you can tell people, and, and it's not making stuff up, it's actually right. And, and, um, and that can get the students more enthusiastic and give the students um, language that when their parents say, like, you know, we're spending $50,000 a year on your study, what? It's like, oh, well, I'm studying the physical system. <laughs> like carved in stone. <laughs> Why don't we open things up now? We can start with Matthew. Oh, thanks. Yeah, the, the, the discussion about sort of standards and evaluation has been really interesting. But I had kind of a quick comment and a question. The quick comment is that I, in 
recent years had the opportunity to review a tenure case of someone who's a digital humanist, nobody in this room. Um, and it was, it was really a striking exercise because I could talk about um, the kinds of traditional scholarship that emerged out of the platform, but I wasn't able to, I don't have the expertise to say much about the platform. Is it properly built? You know, it, 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 how do you, how, who, who's going to say that? Not me, right? <coughs> and so it, it's, it's an odd sort of situation to be disempowered about a half or two thirds of someone's portfolio and try to understand how to talk about it from that perspective. But this leads me to another question. We're talking about you know standards for promotion and things like this. But I'm wondering how we're all going to, you know, what's coming down the, tr the tracks here is um, sort of all digital projects that are going to be standing on their own as honors theses, MA theses, and soon enough, PhD projects. Okay, I mean we're starting to move into the area where it's becoming less and less unimaginable that you'll have a dissertation, you'll have a, a PhD validated not by a traditional dissertation, but in other forms. It's already there in some fields like anthropology, where you can make that, you know, it's long-standing tradition of making um, documentary films. That, 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 but I think that's where we're going with some of this stuff. At some point, the the the, the electronic infrastructure you build is is going to be the thing, right? And how, do, how, how are we prepared in universities to deal with that when it comes? I don't know that the expertise is, is diverse enough. So I just wanted to bounce that off the committee, as, as, off the panelists, as, as people who might be closer to being able to think this through. Uh, one response I would give is that um, we need to broaden perhaps the scope of what we consider to be our peers. And that's sort of an answer to your first comment about how do we evaluate these projects fully, right? There's lots and lots and lots of virtually untapped expertise in our libraries and so forth. So why aren't those people our peers in that sense? Uh, I have many library professionals on committees for MAs uh, of such, right? Because they are the ones who can make that call and can inform uh, the comments and so forth. So I would say, uh, that's probably a place to start. Um, I, I would say that um, I, I've been in this business for a long since well, since before some of you were born. Uh, and I, you know, well, how can you get credit for this digital stuff? And and I think you're at a, a tipping point. You've alluded or sort of touched up upon it. Yeah. To going from if I if it can't if you can't Xerox it print it, it's not scholarship, to if you can represent it as a PDF and that's enough, it's, it's no longer scholarship, if that's all you got. Uh, in other words, at the very least, if you do not have machine actionable links between every statement you make and the, date, the, and the, the, the data upon which it is based, it ain't scholarship. Now, I, 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 I believe that the, the height of scholarship was the original poly where every statement even if it was talking about sun gods in Greek mythology or whatever, nevertheless had the Apollodorus and had all the primary sources. And that is the discipline of our field. And what changes fundamentally is when you have, you can actually get to the damn data and then understand it, guaranteed, that becomes a different kind of publication. That's, that's a simple transformation of traditional publication. What happens as your publication include sampling of, you know, a billion words, and then next next year you have 10 billion words. And how reproducible are your results? Or the, or the data you extract, you're doing topic modeling to understand the reception of Virgil in the 18th century, which you can only do if you have, in any scientific way, if you're working it at a massive scale, and then drilling down and doing close reading, using statistical sampling to uh, understand what you're doing. So this we're really at this and the work that, that my colleagues in the Perseids project building on the CTS architecture have done uh, really has given us put in this position to, to have the signable data uh, and to have the, the trail of who did what in these micro publications to really support this kind of scholarship. We'll just jump around here. <coughs> yeah, so um, I just wanted to um, say that a lot of the stuff that you guys are talking about, Rick was just talking about, um, 
is applicable to things other than text. The exact same techniques work for different data. Uh, and companies in private industry recognize that. Um, we were talking about uh, corpus linguistics techniques in uh, classes. Well, corpus linguists have a habit of ditching the academy and going into industry because it pays better. Um, and it's starting to happen, I know of at least one instance of a classicist doing that, basically taking a classics PhD and now he's a data scientist for Ernst and Young. Um, and I wanted to throw out there that the National Endowment for the Humanities is currently offering up to $750,000 for a department that has a plan for how to take their humanities PhD level training and restructure it so that more of their graduates can move directly into industry <coughs> instead of aiming at the academy. Um, I'm not faculty, so I can't apply for it, but you should, and then I'll help you. <laughs> <laughs> we, we actually got this grant, or one third of it, at Chicago. Um, it's slightly more subtle than this, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's meant to, from day one, orient graduate students to the fact that there are multiple paths out yeah. there, and one is not the positive, and the other is not the negative mm. path. Okay. Uh, so, but, but it, it really is a matter of articulating what the skill sets are that you acquire in, in graduate school in the, in the humanities that we're all very familiar with and that are eminently transferable to jobs in, um, in the Valley or wherever. We, we opened, a, in terms of like this, this you know, aiming at sort of getting a job, we started a, ba a Bachelor of Science in Digital Humanities at Leipzig. Uh, and we hoped to get, we said we wanted 30 people, I hoped to get 10, 110 people showed up. Uh, and, but it was in computer science. Uh, now we had usual attrition, we got about 50 left. Uh, but these are people who have to take CX. Uh, and my, you know, in a sort of kind of draconian way, uh, while doing humanities as well, this is not a traditional thing to do in Germany. Uh, and I'm amazed at this, but I'm also know these guys are all going to have jobs. Uh, they're all going to be, and they're going to have a very interesting, balanced kind of liberal education from this experience. This is kind of a shock to me uh, that it was it worked out as well as it, it seems to be working out as well as it is. Yes. I was excited when you mentioned libraries. Mm -hmm. and, um, while this is happening in classics, the libraries are creating labs. Research support that is has a ton of waste ethic. Um, how have you have libraries supported the projects and the development of digital humanities in your institutions? And if they haven't, what could we do better? Uh, well, I, I will say for my part that uh, I have a very close collaboration with our library team. So um, they come and teach in my class. So that's <laughs> fabulous and in terms of, of that, making their resources available, that sort of thing. Uh, but also, you know, supporting our research, we're doing research together, actually. Our team right now is putting out um, grant applications with the libraries to resolve some of the issues that we're facing. Some of the preservation is a big one and various other things. So um, I'm going to say that, that that collaboration has been fruitful. Uh, and it's not always easy because, uh, you know, libraries are staff and we're faculty and that works differently. And Classics Library meeting tomorrow from 9:45 to 11:45. <coughs> librarians were supporting the development of the open, open of the first thousand years of Greek and open Greek and Latin. And I would actually call myself a digital libraries person, not a digital humanist. So I think this is the, the and the libraries are really developing, as Marie Claire is, is described elsewhere as well, like at UVA. You know, they're supporting the, the students to learn how to do this new kind of scholarship. Can I just add to, as someone who has a classics PhD and was hired as a researcher in a library oh, really? this year, uh, I just say, uh, and with a digital focus, mm -hmm. that um, it's it's been a wonderful position to be in on that side as well, because I, I get to work 
on a number, I, I can work on my own research, but I also have this enormous flexibility to work on the, the other digital projects within the, the institute, <laughs> and work with the faculty. And this gets to what uh, Bruce was talking about, and, and the idea of, of being able to be part of other projects, I mean, there's a theme throughout that, but <coughs> it is, is a really great way to get, get, run, get, get going with uh, research in, in digital classes. So, uh, yeah. De developing sort of a layout of um, familiarity with tools and data. Yeah, the full landscape, uh, as opposed to maybe if you had a, a more specific hybrid, you, 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 you focus. It's, 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 I'm, I'm very lucky and very, very happy to do that. Yeah. I have a question for the panel from mm -hmm. the opposite perspective of where our conversation has gone today about one of the most common critiques to DH that our DHers have stopped doing actual humanities work. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you have advice for us, especially those of us who are already deeply involved in projects. <laughs> <It's too late. laughs> How we can avoid the pitfalls of becoming so stuck in tool development because it's so exciting and because the learning curve is so high that we actually continue to give back to our humanities departments. Especially for, even, even if for those of us at universities that do recognize a project, do recognize that we're doing good work, it's just not necessarily classics work all the time. I, I think any research project takes you away in one way or another from the heart of your discipline. I mean, you, you know, it, uh, and, and I think you will need in your career to either live with that or develop the discipline to keep bringing yourself back to whatever that part is. So, um, I'm about to teach uh, Greek, introductory Greek for the first time in a long time, and just like crazy town, I'm just reading Maccabees just to sort of get into that, right? And that's had to be something that I put a timer on. Tell it pretty cool, I don't know to do. But I don't, that's not going to be, you know, it doesn't matter. Like if you're working on vases that come from this peninsula of the Peloponnese, you know, can you really say that you're like, that, you know? <laughs> It's the same sort of problem for all of us in our specialties, I think. I, I want to comment on Bruce, and I think because everybody has <laughs> <laughs> to, to some extent. So Bruce alluded to you know his work on um, oh, I don't know you said it, something antiseptic, basically getting machine readable Greek out of print, which has been an absolute barrier. And other people have done some work on it. Uh, you know, you know our friend uh, Nick Wright, Nick White, you know in uh, the UK, and we have and Federico, but Bruce has really emerged as the person who has taken this and just beaten on it and done it. Bruce is we now are the, have like 30 million words of corrected Greek, like half of all Greek through 600 CE, uh, is available or coming on, on on the pipe because of Bruce, and we I mean, he has 500 million words of Greek. Worth which you can do data mining with. This is like having the Hubble telescope. This is something you could not do before. Now, it requires Bruce to be able to look at these damn fonts and look at them and try to handle, figure out how they work to, to master and wrangle the system. And it's not just typing things into the existing system, but to create a complete environment. Uh, now, is that classics? I think it is, uh, because it's driven by his understanding of the importance of this critical function. Uh, and only a scholar could do what, would be able to do, I think, what Bruce does. Now, if we had a Nobel Prize uh, for the study of, of Greek and Latin, you know, I'd be, every, all these guys would get one. Uh, and, uh, but I, Bruce would be, but I, I'd be take particular pleasure writing for Bruce because of it, the non obvious, you know, because he addresses that, that exact thing. People may say it's not classics, I think it's exactly. that the Committee for the Translation of Classical Authors is uh, in the process of doing a new digital humanities project that's going to be a searchable bibliography of all the translations of Greek and Latin works from 1869 to the present in as many languages as possible. Um, so I thought people in this room might be interested um, and we're looking for a host institution. <laughs> When do you start? Um, well, we, uh, oh. Oh, when does the project? Have you started already? Yeah. Um, 
uh, at Grand Valley State University, we've just built uh, a pilot of the database, um, but Grand Valley doesn't have the funding to be the host and all of that. So I'd be happy to talk with anyone. I don't want to take up the time here, but afterwards. This, this gets to the library thing, because we actually yes. have a librarian, a, libra a, a, a digital librarian on staff who has a catalog that is designed to track editions and translations. And it works and it's and built and it exploits library standards. So mods records, mads records, fervor, blah, blah. So all the stuff you're supposed to do. Uh, and we need to rebuild, we need a new front end to it. But this is someone who knows exactly how to do what you're describing. Okay. Thank you. Can I just contact you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I was very struck by the image of the Texas data center that, that you put up, because it reminds us that there's this whole other side of the digital humanities, which is the storage and maintenance side that allows us to access these wonderful tools from anywhere, whatever institution we're at. But what can we do as a, as a discipline, a classics discipline, to make sure that the, if a data center in Texas goes up in smoke, that tool doesn't disappear? in a way that if a library went up in smoke, the same book is still on a shelf somewhere. It's hard. Locks, same thing. Lots Locks of copies up. keep stuff safe. Yeah. That's the, so you have distributed, but that's, that's what you want you, your libraries to do. One of like libraries need to redefine their function, and they're not warehousing books in the same way. But preservation, that's what the institute, so we talk, what's beyond the instrumental fallacy what does a library do? It doesn't put books on the shelf. It preserves knowledge. Yeah, and I personally, you know, copy our stuff. You know, it's like, I, that, that's my greatest hope for those images, because it's a huge, a huge number of images, and that kind of, that kind of like, you know, internet to fiber optic cable connectivity is crazy and expensive. Um, and at Houston, they're very generous and they're, they're lo lovely people and they're happy to do it because in, in our wildest fantasies, the Hunter Multitex is going to never produce more than I think a single day of weather modeling data, which is the other thing that building follows, right? <laughs> the stuff the astronomers and the weather and the climate people have. But um, you know, get greedy and download stuff like crazy. So when I know when I when the e codices, the wonderful e codices project came on, like you know my son was complaining bitterly because he couldn't play Dota two, you know at a high ping rate because I was sucking all the data from Europe and I'm trying to get over it. Can I add up to that?